going to be leading that up. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so please come here. There won't be Q&A today, but there will be a time of um, prayer. Starting this Friday, Financial Peace University, it's being led by Jacob Trimper. This is going to be a 10-week class here, 6 to 7 p.m., and they're going to be going through Dave Ramsey's program for getting out of debt. So if you guys haven't been through Dave Ramsey's financial courses, they are very practical, very helpful, and we encourage uh, people if they're interested in learning more about how to, how to budget, how to get out of debt, how to save, those sorts of things, uh, please come to that, that class starting this Friday. This weekend also, Saturday, 9 a.m., right here at Branch of Hope, there will be a time of fellowship, a time of learning, and I believe some breakfast, some food. And uh, the speaker is going to be Mr. Bill Johnson speaking on legacy, what we build and what we leave behind. So the men's breakfasts are kind of being overseen by the deacons. Peter Mullen is the main point of contact if you have questions or if you'd like to sign up, please email the deacons at branchofhope.org so they can get a head count. And then also this weekend, or next weekend, next Sunday after church, there's going to be a fellowship meal, a potluck. Everyone is uh, encouraged to bring a main dish. Singles are asked to bring dinner rolls or dessert. And we'd like to encourage people to bring their dish ready to serve. There is one oven in the kitchen, but it's not... It's kind of first come, first serve, so it's not guaranteed it's going to be available. There are several outlets, though, where you can keep your food warm. So pre-cook and kind of keep it warm here during service, and then it'll be ready to go uh, at 1 p.m. There is a chili cook-off coming February 11th. That's, gonna, that's a Saturday. That's going to be here at 530. That's head up by Seth Kennard, and that's just a good time of uh, good chili. Uh, there's going to be a, some contests, some prizes a panel of uh, tasters uh, for the best chili. I think there's a variety of categories, but that's always a fun time. We are looking for people to bring cornbread and chili toppings uh, as well. So there should be some signups in the foyer. So if you have uh, a desire to come to that, please, please sign up uh, after service. There is one other thing um, we'd like to mention, kind of regarding evangelism, some basic um, announcements. One. How many of you guys have seen these cards before? Maybe some of you. All right, so we printed these up several years ago. It's got a nice little message kind of from Pastor Paul, kind of a, um, you know, come and see type message on the front here. And then on the back, it has all of our uh, church information. So we'd like to encourage people. These are available in the lobby if you uh, grab a few of these and give them out just so we could be kind of outward focused as we seek to invite people to church. There's also some of these new uh, gospel tracts. It's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's from Reformed Gospel Tracts, just really good, full of scriptures. Uh, we encourage you guys. These are available for you guys to take for free and to give away, to uh, share the gospel as you go about your days um, out and about. Uh, third, there are evangelism outings that I go out fairly regularly, and we usually go to the Redondo Beach Pier, but just wanted to encourage people that that's available. Um, people usually come to me and we'll schedule and coordinate times to go out for people who maybe haven't had much experience doing evangelism. Um, they could just come alongside and we go out together and learn and share the gospel and talk to people and, and grow in our faith in that way. And then lastly, uh, in this regard, we are going to be doing uh, throughout the year the session approved what we're calling Sunday evening evangelistic lectures. And uh, we're going to have one April 2nd, which is like the week before Easter. We're going to have one close to Christmas, and then we're going to have one like midsummer. So these are purposely close to those dates um, in order to invite people to the, the Sunday evening kind of lecture. And it's going to be geared towards people who don't know Christ, right? So um, those who haven't made a profession of faith, it's going to be um, just very evangelistically minded. But the goal is also to help encourage all of us as a congregation to, to be involved in inviting people. Um, give us a little bit of a, a reason to be looking outward to our neighbors and friends and the circles that we're in to invite people to come in here about the importance of 
the gospel. And so there will be more details forthcoming as these dates get closer, but just wanted to kind of give you guys uh, a heads up that those things are available uh, to you. So with that, let's go ahead and close the doors, and we are going to get ready uh, to worship uh, the Lord together. So I did want to just welcome you again in the name of the Lord uh, to Branch of Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, we're glad that all of you guys are here. And as we enter into the sacred time, we were praying before, and Pastor Paul kind of just always emphasizes that this is really an otherworldly event that we're about to partake in. Uh, it's a very sanctified time, so uh, we'd like to just take time to quiet our hearts and minds and really prepare to enter into the presence of the Lord. Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 7 through 9. So as we hear these words from Holy Scripture, may the Holy Spirit apply them to our hearts and minister to our souls. Give heed now to the holy word of God. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Thus far the reading of God's word, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we are glad and grateful that you have called each one of us here to your house to gather together, to praise you, to hear your word preached, to seek your mercy and grace, and to come to your table. We thank you for sustaining us this past week, for the work you gave us to do in all the ways you provided for and cared for our needs. Father, we ask that in our time this morning, those who have been saved by your grace would be built up in the true Christian faith and encouraged to live for your glory alone. We ask that those who are still dead in their trespasses and sins, who have yet to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, that they would hear your voice this morning and be made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit according to your sovereign will. That they would know you, that their sins would be forgiven and would experience the peace and joy and comfort that you give to your redeemed people. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would transform all who hear so that we are not just hearers of the word, but doers as well. As we consider the call to worship from Isaiah this morning, we are reminded that those who bring the good news of salvation to the world around them have beautiful feet indeed. Father, we ask that you would continue to work in us, your people, a conviction and a desire to partner with you for the salvation of souls, to be the ambassadors of reconciliation that you have called us to be. May you make our feet beautiful as we move around in this world and seek to bring the glories of heaven, the riches of your kingdom, and the good news of salvation to a world around us that is lost, a people that your word says are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And Father, as we consider your salvation and your promise to redeem the true Jerusalem, I am reminded of the fact that right now nations across the world are at war, and other nations, including our own, are considering entering into these affairs an action that has historically resulted in long, drawn-out conflict where lives and resources are lost and peace never truly reigns. As citizens of heaven, may we proclaim the truth that you have called people as well as nations to kiss the sun, to make peace with God, lest you be angry with them. Help us to be faithful to the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations, and to declare that you reign over all things. And it is your reign that brings true peace. It is your reign that brings glad tidings. It is your reign that brings salvation. So Lord, may we be faithful watchmen, blowing the trumpet to warn those around us to flee from the wrath that is to come to those people and nations who are outside of a covenant with Christ. May we remember that you take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
and be moved with compassion and love for our neighbor as we proclaim your salvation to the world around us. And Lord, may our very lives and the way we go about our days be a witness and testimony to others so that they can see the glory of your salvation. And Father, as we consider our duty to proclaim your salvation and bring the good news of the gospel to the world around us, we are reminded of the great love and salvation that you have lavished upon us, your children. When we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you made us alive together with Christ and saved us by your grace. And that grace is not something we only needed on that day when you opened our eyes and gave us new hearts, but we need that grace day by day, moment by moment. As we continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and grow in our sanctification, there still abides remnants of corruption, and we still war against our flesh, the cares of this world, and the lies of the enemy. And as we continue to overcome, we do so imperfectly. So Lord, in this time now, may we bow humbly and reverently before you as you search our hearts and bring to mind those sins committed openly and in secret, sins in thought as well as in action, areas where we failed to conform to your law and areas where we transgressed your law. Lord, may you work in our heart a godly sorrow over our sin, and may your kindness lead us to repentance. And now in the quietness of our hearts, may we confess these sins to you, and may you remind us of our need for Christ and his cleansing. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayer of confession. Thank you for your word, which promises that if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scriptures declare that God alone has the power and authority to forgive sins. There is no church or priest that has the actual power to forgive sins. That power belongs solely to God. And that forgiveness comes to us and is secured through the blood of Jesus Christ dying for our sins on the cross and defeating sin and death through his bodily resurrection. And Christ tells us in his public ministry that unless we repent, we will perish, and that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. So if by grace through faith you repent of your sins and place your faith in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf for the forgiveness of sins, then I can simply and confidently declare what the scriptures declare, that as far as the east is from the west, so far have your sins been removed from you. Amen.
Today's congregational reading will be continuing with the Heidelberg Catechism with Lord's Day 15. Questions 37 through 39. I'll say the question and we'll answer together. Question 37. What do you confess when you say that he suffered? During all the time he lived on earth, but especially at the end, Christ bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. Thus, by his suffering as the only atoning sacrifice, he has redeemed our body and soul for everlasting damnation and obtained for us the grace of God, righteousness, and eternal life. Question 38. Why did he suffer under Pontius Pilate as judge? Though innocent, Christ was condemned by an earthly judge, and so he freed us from the severe judgment of God that was to fall on us. Question 39. Does it have a special meaning that Christ was crucified and did not die in a different way? Yes, thereby I am assured that he took upon himself the curse which lay on me for a crucified one was cursed by God. Let us pray. Triune sovereign Lord, your steadfast love never ceases and your mercies are new every morning. The heavens declare your majesty and all that you have made bears your mark. Your law is perfect and pure, yet our sin and flesh efface it. However, despite our afflictions and wanderings, your son, Jesus Christ, willfully humbled himself to full obedience of the law and died the death we truly deserve. And now your people can come boldly before your holy of holies without blemish or spot. We pray that your spirit enlivens us to fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith, cleaving to your cross daily. In gratitude, we present our tithes and offerings to you. May the elders and deacons rightly administer these gifts for the furtherance of your kingdom, acting as your hands to lift up those in darkness into the light of your gospel. And may your church seek neither preeminence, glory, or riches. Our honor is that you should reign. Maranatha. Amen. Okay, this is the time in our service where we pray together for the needs of our congregation and come before the Lord corporately. So please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that you've called us to be here. And Lord, there are many, many needs, both in our congregation and in the world around us, that we come here that are heavy on our hearts and that we want to lift up to you, Father God. Lord, we pray for the world around us, which has been seemingly in a time of distress or crisis for the last several years. Father, there are wars, there are rumors of wars, there are many talks of supply chain issues, food shortages, gas, oil shortages, the cost of basic food and necessities has skyrocketed all of which can be a source of worry, anxiety, and fear. And so we cry out to you, Lord, and we pray that you would comfort your people. In times of uncertainty, may we be reminded that you are our rock, that you are our refuge, that you 
are our fortress and our strength. May we set our minds on things above and help us, Lord, to walk with wisdom in the time and place that you have planted us to be a testimony to the world. And Father, we intercede and pray for civil rulers. We pray that they would be true servants of God. We pray that they would kiss the Son, submitting to your law and your precepts, and that they would pursue justice and righteousness in every area in accordance with your word. We pray that the government would punish evil and reward good, and that, Father, you would restrain the beastly tendencies of governments to overstep their God-given jurisdiction, and that you would limit their authority to its proper place. We pray for the church universal, Lord. We pray for those brothers and sisters of ours that are facing persecution. May you guard and protect them and cause their lives to be a testimony to the world around them. We think of Pastor Pan and his congregation as they seek refuge in Thailand. Lord, we pray for Christian missions at home and abroad. We are reminded, Lord, that we are all missionaries. Most of us are called to Judea and Samaria, right where we live, and others are called to the ends of the earth. May we all be faithful witnesses, full of grace and truth, pleading with people to be reconciled to God. We pray for Christian education. We pray, Lord, that your covenant children would be brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and that Christian educational institutions would teach your precepts faithfully to those children who have been entrusted to their care. We pray for churches of like faith with us. We pray for our sister church in Carson, that you would continue to grow and strengthen their ministry in their city, that you would raise up elders and deacons and grow their membership. We pray for the churches in the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition around the world, that they would remain faithful to your word in every area, that they would not be tempted to compromise in any way in order to appease unlawful rulers or attract those seeking carnal or worldly things. And Father, we lift up our whole church here at Branch. We pray for all of our members. We plead for their growth in sanctification. And Lord, we pray that we would all be remembering daily the needs of one another and the care of each other. We pray for the various ministries that are ongoing, ministries designed for fellowship to deepen the relationships between brother and sister. We pray for those that are dedicated to discipling and training up and teaching, those who are committed to outreach, Lord, and those that seek to minister to the physical needs of those around us. And Father, we think of the many in our congregation who are suffering or hurting physically or suffering the loss of a loved one. And we think of Lynette Baker, whose daughter Sheila Baker passed away suddenly from a heart attack recently. And we continue to pray for her and her family that you would give her peace and comfort in her time of mourning. We pray for our sister Bonnie Coronado, who's having surgery on February 6th for two hernias that have been causing her discomfort as a result of her liver transplant. We pray for just a successful surgery and that her recovery would go well, and that she would be at peace leading up to that day, Lord, that you would free her mind from worry or anxiety, that she would just rest in your care and your love for her. Father, we pray for Debbie Levitt's mother, Gwyn, who has lost sight in her eye. We continue to pray for her vision to return and for healing and for Debbie as she ministers to her. We pray for Sister Jen, who had ankle surgery on January 10th, Lord. We pray that the recovery would continue to go well, that you would um, get her back to moving, moving around comfortably and without pain, and that uh, you would bring her back to our congregation here soon, that we could see her and uh, enjoy worship with her. We pray for Irene Thompson, who has knee surgery on February 6th, Lord. We pray that that would go well and that you would just continue to minister to her as she deals with many different chronic pain conditions. 
We thank you, Lord, for the covenant children that are in utero, in the womb. We pray for Ali Long, who's due in February, and we pray that the, uh, the rest of the pregnancy would be, would be smooth and that the delivery would go well and that mother and child would both be healthy and strong. Pray for the many battling dementia and Alzheimer's disease, Lord, and their families that are ministering to them. Father, we think of Monica, Carolyn, Rosie, Fred, Kim, and Maria. We pray for them. We pray that you would miraculously restore their mind and memories and that you would be with the families and give them wisdom and peace and endurance and strength as they love and care uh, for their family. Lord, in the, we think of the many who are battling cancer. We pray for uh, healing, peace for the families, peace for the individuals, um, upcoming uh, surgeries and operations, Lord, to get rid of cancer. Um, we pray that all of those would go well. We think of um, the loved ones, the husbands, the wives who are caring um, for those in need, and we pray that you would be with them as well. Give them an extra dose of your grace and mercy, Lord, and your peace, and pray, the Lord, that you would use all of these things uh, to sanctify us, to remind us of our need for you, um, remind us of our frailty, Lord, and just draw, draw us closer, ever closer to you. We think of Karen Gregg, uh, sister-in-law of Mike and Michelle, battling brain cancer for the third time. Pray for Jeannie, who's battling breast cancer and her upcoming lumpectomy. We pray for Julie Herzl for continued healing and comfort and good treatment. We pray for Andrea Lucero. Pray for Rex Monson. Pray for Debbie, the mother of Carrie Booth, and Jeannie, the niece of Mike Keon. We pray for all of them, Lord, that you would heal them and bring them comfort during this time. Lord, we think of our missionaries, Mark and Jenny Richline in Uruguay, and we pray for the training of elders and deacons um, for the Salvos por Gracia congregation. And Father, as we lift up all these needs, may, may we just be uh, reminded of your, your loving care, your loving kindness, and your faithfulness to us. Father, you are the great healer, you are the great physician, and so help us to trust you more and more as we go through these trials and tribulations. And finally, Lord, we turn our attention to the preaching of your word. We pray for our pastor. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for the work that he does uh, week in and week out to bring us the word of God, to faithfully open up your word and declare your truth. We pray that you would speak through him today, uh, that your spirit would use his words uh, with your word to uh, correct us, rebuke us, instruct us in righteousness, Lord, that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work that you have appointed for us uh, to do. So we thank you for this time, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
seated. Good morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 21. Also, really want to encourage all of you to be uh, participate in the prayer time today. There, and will be leading during the Sunday school hour. I don't know about you. Uh, when the Bible talks about wrestling in prayer, I, I very much um, identify with that. I find I have to be honest. With you, I find praying exhausting. It's. I mean, I don't. Sometimes I'll be praying with people and they'll fall asleep. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done that. I, I feel like it's a fight. You know. I mean, that's that's the way it's talked about, right? In the Bible, it's talked about like a wrestling match and. And so I, I know that it requires some effort, and uh, so, but it also is critically important for the advancement of the kingdom and the prosperity of the true prosperity of the church, and so I really want to encourage you to participate in that today, and also we do have this um, visitation uh, class, and for those of you who are interested in ministering to people in our church who just can't make it, you know, for various reasons, and uh, it's, people enjoy uh, somebody visiting them, so I encourage you to do that as well. All right, so we are in Revelation chapter 21, we are really turning the corner here in this chapter, and uh, we're only looking at two verses today, but it, there, it's chock full, new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem, so we're just going to read Revelation 21, verses 1 and 2. Hear now the word of God. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that we would be able to understand why you, by your spirit, gave this message through Christ to John for those churches, and that to the extent we find ourselves in similar situations, that we would take the great comfort that is found here and recognize that it is for us as well. So we do pray that you would help us to grasp and enjoy very deep and rich things, eternal things, things that human words can hardly express. We do pray, Father, though, to the best of our ability, we would understand what you would have us know. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. David S. Clark, of this turn in Revelation, wrote this. He wrote, at the beginning of chapter 21, we arrive at the watershed that divides time and eternity. The writer proceeds in this long passage to disclose the glorious abode and beatific destiny of those whose names were written in the book of life. Our story, therefore, leads us beyond the confines of this world or this age or earthly affairs to view things in a vastly different condition from anything we know here. The heart of the church has ever beat in response to this revelation of its heavenly home. No sin, no sorrow, no pain, no death. Where can such unearthly features find a place? When I was in college, I played two sports. In reflection, I realized something as I looked back, that I, uh, I kind of created a defense mechanism for myself by, by being on more than one team. If my, if my performance waned in, in one sport, and I don't, I'm not saying I did this consciously, it was kind of subconscious. So if I was doing poor in one sport, I took comfort in the notion I had, I had the other sport. I mean, it was the two sports. It was Long Beach State, track and, and volleyball. And if I was doing poorly in track, I'd be like, you know what? But I'm better in volleyball than every guy on the track team. <laughs> <laughs> and if I was doing poor in volleyball, I was like, uh, you know, I'd say I'm the better in track 
than anybody on the volleyball team. And if I was doing four in both, I'd be like, well, I do play two sports. <laughs> and I had some way of like handling it psychologically. Now, I'm not here advocating splitting one's devotion. I'm not saying that's a good way to approach it. It's just an observation of how one might secure an, an identity when things aren't really going well. Like we're going, okay, how do, I, how do I psychologically navigate through this? How do I find significance in who I am? Where do I find direction in what's going on in life? And as a college student, those are big deals at that age. I remember just wrestling through that kind of stuff when I was a teenager in my early 20s. So I'm not advocating kind of going, well, just involve yourself in enough things that you can find comfort here, 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 and here. What I am advocating, though, is securing an identity in that which cannot be disturbed. Building one's house, as it were, upon a rock. Now, at the writing of this letter, at the writing of Revelation, the hub of religious significance was deposited in Jerusalem. There was a deep sense of religious identity associated with being a citizen of Jerusalem. I mean, if you read your Bibles, from Genesis to Revelation, it's Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. But Jerusalem had descended into a city that Jesus taught kills the prophets. He's weeping over that city. And, and at the writing of the Revelation, the judgment of Jerusalem was nigh. The judgment of Jerusalem was coming soon. Now, let me just say, you know, this idea of kind of enjoying being part of Jerusalem, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I think there are certain things that can be good in their proper context and at their proper level. Patriotism, I think, can be a good thing. I mean, you know, there, there's... It's a hot topic right now, you know, nationalism and what have you. School spirit. I think school spirit could be a good thing. You know, you wear the colors of your school, your sweatshirt or whatever it is. Prioritizing and valuing your family, being very much into your family, obviously is a good thing. I think commitment and devotion to your business to be somebody who's dedicated to your workplace is a good thing. But any one of those good things can become an idol. It can become the most important thing in your life. I, I can't tell you how many lunches I've had with people who are unbelievers, and they'll say something like, family is everything. And at some level, I appreciate that, but that is just not true. I mean, Jesus, you know, it's almost controversial when Jesus was told, your mother and family are outside. And he's like, who is my mother? Who is my family? It's like some, some people think that even sounded disrespectful. I don't think it was. I think he's making a point that anything, even your own family, as valuable as that is, can become an idol. Your nation can become an idol. Your workplace can become an idol. Your school can become an idol. And I bring that up because I think that's what was happening with Jerusalem. Great promises were made to Abraham in terms of his progeny, in terms of his descendants. Out of Abraham, we would have this nation, right? Israel. And the heart of Israel would be Jerusalem. And when you're reading the Old Testament, you're seeing God making great promises in relationship to that but a misguided understanding of what it meant to be a child of Abraham. An improper understanding of what that actually meant became a source of great darkness. It became a source of spiritual destruction. 
Now keep in mind here, this is, this is a promise. This isn't a school or a nation or a workplace. This is a religious environment. It's Abraham. It's Israel. It's Jerusalem. And they're like going, well, wait a minute. Should I not take comfort and find my identity in the fact that I'm an Israelite? But John the Baptist turned the burners up on people who took an undue comfort in that ethnicity, in that physical progeny, in that citizenship, the mere citizenship of Jerusalem. We see it early on in Matthew. He says, and do not think to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Like, why would he even say that? The fact that he would say that meant that they were taking an undue comfort or peace or power or authority in the fact that they were somehow related to Abraham. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. You see, one is hard-pressed to find a city, or really any geographical location in the Bible that receives as much attention as Jerusalem. You're, if you don't understand Jerusalem, you're not going to understand the Revelation. The Revelation talks all about Jerusalem. But Jerusalem, and we need to understand this, and all of the religious structures in Jerusalem, all the artifacts in Jerusalem, all the ceremonies revolving around Jerusalem, all the rituals that took place in Jerusalem were merely pedagogical. And what, that, what I mean by that is they were, they were there to get us to learn about something else. They, they were designed to get us to think about something beyond Jerusalem. Jerusalem. To focus on Jerusalem is like looking at the photo of a loved one who's moved away. You know, you got a child who's gone to college, right? So you got a picture of them. Or maybe your spouse has been deployed and you have a picture of them. And that picture, that picture should help you remember them. That picture should help you love them. That picture should remind you of them, but the picture shouldn't supplant them, right? You, you, if, when that person shows up, when, when your spouse who is deployed shows up, you need to stop looking at the picture, right? When your student comes home from college, you got to look at them. By the way, that's what Hebrews was all about. It was all about everybody was more into the, 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 that which was designed to teach about Christ than they were into Christ. Jerusalem and its temple at this point in history were just getting in the way. And, and it was about to be destroyed. I mean, the author of Hebrews says it is obsolete and it's vanishing away. That old covenant that revolved around the temple, it's obsolete, and God was going to get it out of the way. It had become a distraction. And by the way, because it's probably not true of you and me, like, we, you know, unless you're really into, you know, going to Jerusalem or something like that, we probably don't think about Jerusalem that much in terms of a distraction but it goes beyond Jerusalem to the entire created order. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. I, I, I noticed this morning, by the way, when I was <laughs> looking through my notes, that I didn't really talk about no more sea. And I know there are a lot of people who, in our church who surf, and they're like, hey, what's up with that? I mean, and I, I really enjoy the sea myself. I mean, I used to surf. I don't anymore, but I, go, I try to go down there. About, and I, I, do, I do tend to think that in the Bible, the sea 
was not associated with um, surfing, <laughs> but it was associated with like turmoil. And so I, I don't, you know, to what extent the new heavens and the new earth will or will not have a sea or a sun or hat, I don't think that you guys who surf need to, or girls who surf need to get all worried about it. But move on, moving on to deeper things. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the first heaven, because I've been talking about Jerusalem, but here we see it's become universal, right? You're not addressing merely Jerusalem. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. You see, this fallen world is its own distraction. Keep in mind, the recipients of this letter, they were going through all sorts of difficulty, either from the Roman Empire or from the Jerusalem, and, and they're, kind of, they're kind of getting caught up in it. And, and this is written to them in such a way as to get them to be able to navigate through the fact that the world was kind of letting them down. And so what they're, what they're reading here is, no, this stuff that is bothering you, it's passed away. And there's a new heaven and a new earth. Now, you know, uh, Jason had mentioned that, you know, in our prayers before coming out here, I will oftentimes pray about that we would all recognize that in this very unique consecrated gathering called church, not because of the building or anything else, but when God's people gather together in this special way where we have word and sacrament and the praise of God together, there's something very otherworldly about that because we are joining with the church victorious in this worship. I mean, we're not just here alone. All, they're all, we're engaging in something that is, is both happening here, but celestial as well. At the, so so we, we've got our focus upon this new heavens and this new earth. But when we, when we start talking otherworldly, we need to be careful that we're not saying in that that we don't care for the world or care about the world. That's not what we're saying. We, we should not read our Bibles in such a way as to advocate some type of continual otherworldly floatiness. I remember when I was a kid, every year we'd watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. And after he had, you know, his encounter with God, you know, on, on the mountain, he came down and you know, he would walk around with this, like, glare, like, on his face, like, like he's, he was otherworldly, and he was almost incapable of having a communication with because he was just always looking like he was in a trance. And I, I understood C.B. DeMille's point when he was saying, look at Charles, Chuck, I used to say Chuck Heston, you got to really look like you had an encounter with God. What would that look like? Well, it would look like nothing else matters, and I'm kind of zoned into whatever he was looking at up there. You know, because you people do that, right? They'll be like, "You're like, well, what, is he, what are they looking at up there?" <laughs> so we shouldn't have this otherworldly floatiness taking place. What we should be careful of is not having our hope in this world. We've got to have this continual reminder that my peace, my hope is not attached to the old earth, the old heaven, which has passed away. The recipients of this letter, and I would argue Christians ever since, need continual reminders of a new heaven and a new earth. We need to always think that way. We can't stray too far from recognizing that our true identity is found in the citizenship in the new heaven and the new earth. 
Now, I'm not going to engage in all the speculation over orbiting around the nature of this transition because I think in Revelation 20, they really are kind of going, look at this is the consummation. This is the end of history. This is, you know, the, the real focus here in chapters 21 and 22, I do believe, are kind of like going, it's a fully orbed presentation of heaven. The, the full, as we understand heaven, the fullness of heaven. But I, but I think it's important for you to understand a little bit of the debate here. And I'll just, I guess I'll just put it this way. I don't think the consummation, and by the consummation we're talking about the end, of, the end of history as we know it and the beginning of eternity as we know it. I don't think what happens here is the, the utter destruction of all things and God creating everything ex nihilo, out of nothing, the way he did when he first created the heavens and the earth. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think we need to probably think about it more along the lines of our own death and resurrection, that, that, that there is a time in the future we will die and our spirits go to be with the Lord and there's a time at the end of history when our souls, our spirits are joined with our, the self-same bodies with which we died, right? And so God gives us new resurrected bodies, but he doesn't create them ex nihilo. It's not a new creation. It's not out of nothing. There's something very deep about that. I think there's something very almost mysterious about that. But it's not as if God is creating new people. He is resurrecting old people. And they become new people. And I think Paul in Romans compares we, us as individual Christians groaning for our redemption that is found in Christ to the entire created order groaning for its redemption that is found in Christ as well. And so all that to say, I think this idea of, you know, the new heavens and the new earth in its full consummation is the idea of God not creating things brand new, but restoring that which was destroyed by the first Adam, which is all renewed in Christ, the second or last Adam. We can ask, you can ask me more about that during Q&A, which we're not having today. <laughs> but here's where I want to go a little bit with this. Because in a certain sense, in a certain sense, and that's it's a big phrase in logic, right? This new heavens and this new earth has already begun. We, we are already called, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, some of your versions will say new creatures, but it, it actually is, in the Greek, we are a new creation. If you're in Christ, right now, you are a new creation. In a certain sense. I mean, and, you know, when I mentioned that when we gather together, we're worshiping with the church victorious, Right? In a certain sense, Christians are already seated with Christ, right? Ephesians 2.6, that God has raised us up together. Like, it almost sounds like a resurrection, doesn't it? He has raised us up and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's in the aorist tense. It's in the past tense. That's just, this has already happened to you. Old Testament references to the new heavens. I'm going to make a little argument here, if you don't mind. Old Testament references to the new heavens and the new earth are difficult to read in such a way as to consign it entirely to the consummation. Now, again, you understand what I mean when I say consummation? I'm talking, you know, the consummation is the end of human history and eternal state. So that is, at that point, you have the, the consummation. Right? Just so you understand the language here. And what I'm saying is, it's hard to read the new heavens and the new earth as entirely and only referencing that which takes place at, after the end of history. It's hard to read it that way. And let me give you an example why. Because what we see it primarily in, first in, is Isaiah 65, 17. 
So the first reference to the new heavens and the new earth is found in, I, written 600 years before the time of Christ. And we see that I'm going to create a new heavens and a new earth. And as that new heavens and new earth is being described, we read this. Verse 20 of chapter 65. No more shall there, shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. So I remember wrestling through this, and I, mean, I don't know how much you guys wrestle through stuff like this, because here's the deal. The, um, the premillennialist will say Isaiah 65 is talking about the millennium after the second coming. That Jesus came and you got this thousand year millennial period. One of the big problems with that is there's nowhere anywhere in the text, anywhere near that's saying that this happens after the second coming. That's just a, an imposition on it. You're just going, this is the way I believe and so that's where this fits. But if you read Isaiah, you're not going to find that anywhere in Isaiah. The amillennialist who are a lot closer to what we think as the, well, what I think, we have all millennials in our church, and we love them dearly. <laughs> but the all millennial position is, no, this is a description of the eternal state. Okay, but can you see a problem with that? If this is speaking metaphorically of the eternal state, it's not a very good metaphor. It is difficult because it says the young person will die at how old? A hundred. Here's the deal. It's difficult for a metaphor of death to mean anything other than death. P people don't die in heaven. When we go to heaven, there's going to... So, so you can see where I'm looking at that going, boy, this is just not working. This is, there is a sense in which we have to recognize that the new heaven and the new earth has already begun. In a certain, I'll put it this way, unconsummated sense, we are currently living in the new heavens and the new earth. We are a new creation. You are a new creation. Citizens of the new heaven and new earth it's that other team that you're on. When things aren't going well on this team, don't think about the track team. Don't think about work. Don't think about your school. I mean, when you're kind of going, wow, who am I? What's my identity? What's my strength? Where's my direction? And on and on. What you need, where your mind needs to go is to the new heavens and the new earth. It needs to go to that eternal citizenship and not allow yourself to get too wrapped up in the fact that this world, which I do think we should care about, this world that I do think that we should kind of work with and in, is simply not our identity. Your identity needs to be something deeper and richer and eternal. Now, the recipients of this letter probably took great comfort in this because for them, the potential of being put to death was imminent. Like, they, they knew that I don't have tomorrow promised. They were dealing, you know, with, the, with Nero. They were dealing with heavy persecution, as Paul said, like, like sheep being led to the slaughter daily. We, we live in a culture where we don't kind of function that way. We, we kind of like, death is just way out there. You know, we, we hide it. But, but we need to kind of recognize that there is an eternal peace and there's an eternal hope and there's an eternal kingdom and there's a new heaven and a new earth and in a certain sense, we're already citizens of it. Citizens of the new heaven and the new earth are part of that glorious 
and strong and unshakable kingdom because it is built upon Christ himself. He's the cornerstone of it. And I might add here that our citizenship in this new heaven and new earth so far, so far away from leading us into an ineffective, floaty, other worldliness should make us strong, secure, joyful, confident, bold, and a blessing to the current world in which we live. That's a, I'm going to tell you, it's a pet peeve of mine when people have a religious conviction that completely alienates them from what's going on here right now. Palpable, touchable, observable. There's this kind of, you know, like I said, the word floatiness comes to mind. And your, your Christian life, even though its genesis comes from that which is another should not be non-existent in terms of that which others see. For, um, for years, we had a ministry um, when I was a youth pastor a long time ago to a certain orphanage in Mexico. We'd load up our van and drive to this orphanage. And we'd get, you know, we had this church van and we'd and uh, put food and clothes and toys and supplies, right? And we'd get up early and drive across the border. And the young woman who was spearheading this, who it's not in the notes, but was Julie Herzl. Um, You know, she was probably still in college at the time. Uh, Then her name was Drink Ward. She was the one who spearheaded this. She had a real relationship with, uh, with that orphanage. But I remember Julie making a comment one time, because we'd go to this orphanage, I mean, it was just poverty stricken, right? And we'd show up in this van and just unload all sorts of stuff. And I remember Julie kind of going, I wonder what these kids think in terms of where we came from that we could drive down here and open up this van and have all this loot like, what, like, where are you guys from? You know, imagine a four-year-old who has never owned a pair of shoes. They don't have hardly any food. They don't have two nickels to rub together. And then the church van shows up, and all, all the teenagers come out, and Julie and me and Mick, and all of a sudden it's like, here's a bunch of stuff. And she, was, she would be like, what do they think of where we live that we could do this? You see, in one sense... We came from America, you know, well, I guess North America. In one sense, we came from the United States. The United States has always been, historically, a pretty prosperous nation. Matter of fact, a lot of people would say, hey, this nation has been a blessing to the world. A lot of people view the United States that way. I kind of am one of them. But I think it's only been a blessing to the world because of the influence of the Christian faith upon this nation. And when the influence of the Christian faith wanes from this nation, we we should not think that this nation will be a blessing to the world. Because ultimately, the blessing that those kids were experiencing in the deeper sense wasn't coming from the United States. It was coming from the kingdom of God. And when we lose that, we lose everything. There's a great mistake people make when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to this idea of a new heaven and a new earth and who we are in it. I even hear this error from seminary students. It's just kind of a way that's being taught. When we speak, and you know in our church, we're very much into Christ and culture as a church. We, we do believe that, that the Christian faith should have an impact upon the culture in which we live And that is not always uh, embraced even in the Reformed community in terms of like, you know, culture wars and what have you. And I will hear seminary students and they've they've been, they've visited our church and they'll raise their hand when they hear us talking about the kind of effect the church should have upon the world. And they'll raise their hand and they'll quote Jesus from John 18, 36 and they'll say, but Pastor Paul, Didn't Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world? 
you understand kind of what they're being taught here. What they're being taught is, my kingdom is not of this world, means that my kingdom is not in this world. Or they're being taught that my kingdom should have a negligible effect upon the world. But of course, Jesus isn't saying that at all. Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not of this world. He's not saying it's not in the world. He's not saying it's not having an effect upon the world. And yet, somehow we read that in such a way as to go, no, no, there's something entirely different taking place here. That van that we took was not of, if I can put it this way, just so you understand the point, it did not originate in that little orphanage in Mexico. That that van was of, if you will, the United States. All right? We loaded it up, and that's where it began. That was kind of the beginning point. And again, I think the beginning point really was the kingdom of God, but we were in Redondo Beach loading it up. That's where we came from. That's where we were of. But when we drove down in to Rosarita, and we stopped at the orphanage, it was our prayer very much that it would have an effect upon those children. It was in Rosarita. It wasn't of Rosarita, but it was in Rosarita. And it was having an effect upon Rosarita. And I think we need to think that way in terms of our citizenship in heaven. As Christians, we should, and I want to push this metaphor too far, but we all should be vans filled with blessings for the world in which we live. And not just hamburgers and hot dogs and chicken and toys, but even as Jason was saying, you know, the message of the gospel, the truth, the wisdom of God. Like we are all vans and, we, you know, the door opens and I do pray that every one of us view ourselves as having a responsibility to be a blessing to the world in which we live. Philip Schaff writes of the magnitude of these blessings. He wrote this, Religion is not a single separate sphere of life, but the divine principle by which the entire man is to be pervaded, refined, and made complete. It takes hold of him in his undivided totality in the center of his personal being to carry light into his understanding, holiness into his will, and heaven into his heart, and to shed thus the sacred consecration of the new birth and the glorious liberty of the children of God in his whole inward and outward life. No form of existence can withstand the renovating power of God's spirit there is no rational element that may not be sanctified, no sphere of natural life that may not be glorified. We, we are to be that. The Christian faith is uh, something God is doing in you for you to do for others. It doesn't, it doesn't stop with you. You know, we talk about spiritual gifts, right? And we haven't talked a lot about spiritual gifts recently, but the gift isn't for me. If I have a spiritual gift, the gift isn't for me. It is given to me to give to somebody else. We should be a kingdom of re-gifters. Right? We get something, it's used for the mutual edification of the saints, for others. And moving, you know, to finish up here, because we've talked about the new heavens and the new earth, and we talked a little bit about Jerusalem, but the heart of this is the new Jerusalem. That's the heart of all of this. The old Jerusalem it had become like the world. The, the, the Apostle Paul, and I hope we can appreciate the fighting words that he's using here in Galatians, he's talking about the Jerusalem that now is. In other words, that physical nation of Jerusalem at the time of that writing he said, they are like the children of Hagar. All right, now, if we really understood our Old Testaments, we would recognize what an insult that would be 
to the Israelite to say, you know, you guys are children of Hagar. You know whose Hagar's son was, right? Ishmael. Look, they're still fighting to this day. Right? That little mistake that Abraham made 3,000 years ago, there's still wars in the Middle East. They still don't get along, but Paul's going, look at, you know what? You are not an Israelite. You're an Ishmaelite. The Jerusalem that now is. They were in bondage with their children. Bondage is the nature of all man-made religions, whether they call themselves religions or something that sounds more sophisticated than religion, you know, a philosophy of life or what have you. But there is a different freedom-bearing Jerusalem. Paul put it this way, but the Jerusalem above, right? This, this new Jerusalem is free. And she is our mother. Not, not the one in the borders, the Jerusalem above. Now, again, I, I read this and I think, you know, freedom, you know, the truth shall set you free. This idea of freedom or liberty, it is a very common biblical motif, right? This idea of being set free. I mean, it goes all the way back to the Exodus, right? They were in bondage. God set them free. I mean, I'm just, let me say if I can just throw this out to you in such a way for you to understand kind of at least my heart when I think of our church. We have, you know, deacons come up here and there's elders who come up here and they'll say things and there's a presentation. You ever go to a church, you know, churches kind of have a vibe. You know what I'm talking about? Like some of them seem friendly, some of them don't seem friendly, some of them seem austere, some of them seem just kind of like hippie-ish. You know, there's all sorts of things, you know. But I, I am often think to myself this idea of true liberty, right? My, my yoke, this yoke that we have with Christ, this, this burden is, is light. I often think to myself, will people walk away from our church feeling burdened, constrained, yoked? Will they walk away kind of feeling like, man, if I become part of that church, my life is going to be very, very difficult and I can feel the constraints and the weight of it. And I, I think to myself, I do pray that anybody who would be exposed to our church and our teaching and our ministry and our liturgy would walk away with the joy of knowing that they are citizens of that new heaven, that new earth, they are that new Jerusalem which gives us freedom. Now, I'm not talking about freedom to sin. I'm not talking, because that's not freedom at all. I'm not talking about this idea that there's no right or wrong, but this idea that you're kind of going, you know what, I've been set free from something that the world has had me in shackles. The world has me in shackles, and those shackles come off in Christ. I mean, you read Matthew 23, what the religious leaders of Israel were doing to their people. Those are some pretty choice words that Jesus is, is using. He goes, you know what? You religious leaders, you go out and you're making disciples and they become twice as much a son of hell as yourself. I mean, the religion had become bad. But there's, there's something in terms of our Christian faith, as hard as we have to work, as much as we have to kind of exercise self-control and do that which is good and love God and love our neighbor and be exercise self-denial and sacrificial, there should be something within our hearts where we go, you know what, I'm free. I'm free from what the world wants me to be. I'm free from who the world is telling me I am. And I'm a citizen of an eternal kingdom, my eternity. That's where there is true freedom. And we need to think that way. There is no true peace found. There's no true freedom found in any city or nation, even the city whose name means city of peace, Jerusalem. The name means foundation of peace, city of peace, and it had become anything but that. No, there's a new Jerusalem. This is the passage, right? There's a new Jerusalem. 
And I'm going to argue that this new Jerusalem, that was the city that Abraham was actually looking for. You know, if you read the Old Testament, right, God says to Abraham, you know, leave where you are, go to where I tell you to go, and he's doing all this stuff, traveling around the Middle East, go to this land, go to that land, I'm going to give you this land, and go to that land. But when we get to the New Testament, especially Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews is kind of going, you guys don't understand the Old Testament. Abraham wasn't really concerned about that land. Oh, did he have to go to that land? Yeah, he went to that land. He was, you know, he sought to be obedient. But in Hebrews 11.10, we read this. For he, that was Abraham, was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And by the way, we're not merely in that city. In a certain sense, we are that city. Here's, by the way, an example where the, the semiotics of Revelation force us away from kind of a wooden literalism. With people, when people say, oh, you've got to take Revelation literally, we've already talked about how almost impossible that is. But here's one, because you've got this new Jerusalem, right? It's a city. We'll get into more details later in other sermons. It's a city, but what is it also? It's a bride. I mean, how are you going to draw a picture of that? A city with a wedding gown on? Like, what does that look like in terms of a picture? So he's combining two images here. One is a city, and one is a bride. And it should not be confusing to us when we hear about a bride. When we read about a bride in the Bible, what are we reading about? Yeah, it's the church. It's you. It's me. The life of a church or the life, your life, my life, the life of a Christian, as it were, is like the aisle of a wedding. And that aisle, walking down that aisle, is a voyage of sanctification. You know, you, the, the door swings open, and, you know, the bride already is dressed in white, right? And yet, as you're walking down the aisle, that is a, a picture of the husband, who in this case is Christ, but by the way, it should be husbands as well, washing her with the water of the word that she might be holy, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. And at the consummation, which is at the end of the aisle, at the end of this processional, she has ultimately been cleansed and she is pure. And in the consummation, she is without sin by the blood of Christ. I tell you, it's quite the challenge for husbands who are called to live and die for their wives the way Christ lived and died for the church. It's a heavy thing. The washing of the water with the word, and at the end of this, at the end of all of this, even though, even though right now, if you will, as the bride of Christ, we're dressed in white, and when God sees us, he sees, as it were, the righteousness of Christ. It is, so she's, you get the image here? She's already dressed in white walking down the aisle. But by the time she gets all the way down to the end, at the end of the processional, she's actually been completely sanctified in glory. Now we're going to speak more of the tabernacle of God with men in our next meeting for now. Let us be assured that by faith, I mean, how do you know that you're part of that bride? By faith, we are cherished members of his body. Let us know now, right now, as we sit here, that we are called to recognize and to take comfort that our true identity is in that new heaven, in that new earth, wherein righteousness dwells. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray 
that as uh, the distractions of this world seem to want to win our heart, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life, all these shiny things, Father, that we would never lose sight of the fact that our true citizenship is in the new heavens and the new earth and that we are in fact, Father, that bride adorned, as it were, by the grace of God through the victory of Christ to be cleaned, to be sanctified, to be made holy without blemish, help us to rejoice in who we are in Christ and may that affect every last single decision, every move we make in this life. To your glory we pray in Jesus' name, amen. and I'm going to ask the deacons and the elders to come forward as we participate in the Lord's Supper together. And it is a joy and a privilege that I have as a minister to invite all who are right with God and His church through faith in the Lord Jesus to come to the Lord's table. So if you have received Christ and are resting upon Him alone for salvation as He has offered to you in the gospel. If you are a baptized and professing communicant member in good standing of a Christian church that professes the gospel of God's free grace, then this supper is for you, and I invite you in Christ's name to eat the bread and drink the cup. And I do pray that um, our participation in this is um, a source of great peace and joy and assurance. And um, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that um, r religious kind of liturgies and religious organizations, uh, the religious process can be difficult. I mean, I, I didn't come out of the womb as a pastor, and I, was, um, I wasn't even raised in a Christian household, but I do remember feeling, I, fe I remember being part of a, on a mission, and I felt like the whole labyrinth of things that they were having us do and the things they were saying to us made me feel like distant from God. As a matter of fact, I can't really draw very well, but I drew a picture 
and I drew a picture, and I just on one side I wrote God, and then I wrote, I drew a picture of all the ministries and all the stuff that they were having us do and what they were saying to us, and on the very other side of that, I drew a picture of me, and I felt like this entire ministry is in between me and God. It's in the way. And I, I've never forgotten that. And I, it's my prayer that, that whatever ministry we have as deacons and elders and myself as a pastor would never kind of make you feel like, well, there's God. Then there's Branch of Hope Church. And here I am on the other side of that. Rather, we would have a church that would so bring you to the table of Christ himself. That, that you would you would say that you would walk away going this is this is where I've met Christ through word and sacrament and so that's that's a prayer and so recognizing at the same time that that we're about to embark upon is very dangerous business people were taking and eating and drinking in an unworthy manner and getting sick and dying I mean it's God's way of saying don't trifle with this be careful with this I mean, I think of um, James and I were talking about Uzzah right, and the ark. And uh, R.C. Sproul had made the comment, you know, the, the ark is toppling because they didn't load it right. right? There's a way to carry, there was a way to carry the ark. Uzzah, the Kohathite, they were taught their whole life how to carry it. And they're like, yeah, we'll just carry it this way. And it starts falling. And Uzzah, remember, you know what Uzzah did, right? He's like, oh, he can't have that fall. And he touches it. And what happens to Uzzah? That which was a blessing to God's people was not a blessing to us. He struck dead. And Sproul made an interesting point. His comment was, Uzza thought his hands were cleaner than the dirt that the ark was going to fall on. I thought that was a really interesting point to make. I've always viewed it a little differently. I kind of thought to myself, if we were transporting a cauldron of molten lava and it began to fall, would I try to stable it? I don't think so. Well, what I, I think I'd run away. So it's kind of like going, you, you, we've already got a predisposition of something that is holy as if it's casual, and we shouldn't have that. And we are to approach the table, table of God with great fear, at the same time recognizing that one of the designs of the Lord's Supper is to relieve the fear. I mean, it's like the amazing grace that taught my heart to fear. And the same grace relieves those fears. All this to say, if you believe in Christ and you God is the first thing God tells you to do is be baptized. It's something that will do for you. And this and historically, by the way, being baptized was a sign of membership in the Christian church. That's kind of the way you outwardly were observed as being part of the covenant family, that people were baptized. And God has given this responsibility to the church. So believe and be baptized and be part of that covenant family known as the church. And then this meal is a meal that God has designed to nurture you and strengthen you and help you understand more fully what it means to be part of that new heavens and that new earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would consecrate these elements from a common use to a sacred use, and we do pray, Father, that, that our hands for a bit would tremble and then that our hearts, Father, would find peace. In the blood of Christ, in his name, amen.
the Apostle Paul writing to the church, the church at Corinth, wrote this. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat. In the same manner, we also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's hard for our minds to excel to that place where we understand that which was purchased by the blood of Christ, the eternal effects of his victory. We do, Father, offer to you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving that you've included us in that victory, that you took our sinful hearts our minds that had no interest in the things of God, and that you gave us, Father, your spirit, that we might believe and inherit the riches of the kingdom of heaven. And for this, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn. <laughs> to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.